to step into cross-cultural relationship. You're going to be displaced for the rest of your life. Um, Jesus was poor. He was um, um, Jewish, and he lived under Roman oppression. And so we see culture taking place throughout scripture uh, in Acts when it says the Bible it says that they were first called Christians in Antioch. And we discover what happens when the church gets persecuted. Well, the Jews scatter and the Christians scatter rather. And if you go back and look at Acts, the Christian converts, they are only talking to Jewish people, people of Jewish descent when they first are persecuted. And the Bible says that you have men from Cyprus and Cyrene, which are African uh, locales in the New Testament. And the first time you have these African Christians come, they're the ones who say, we're going to go talk to the Gentiles. And so you see the church spread cross-culturally because you've got people of color or subdominant groups going out and sharing the gospel. So in a short answer, yes, I think the Bible is sufficient enough to help us look at issues of racial reconciliation in the sense that it models a different worldview. Um, the Bible illuminates this idea of all of these different cultures together that there's cultural diversity, but there's spiritual unity at the foot of the cross. Uh, we have a history of racism and classism and all of the isms in the West. And as a consequence, one of the reasons why we have ethnic specific churches um, is because we've never dealt with the issues of race here in America. The black church exists because of racial and systemic oppression that um, ostracized it from the dominant culture or white church really from the time in which African-Americans first arrived in the United States. So. At a basic level, yes, I think you can do your due diligence without question and study the scriptures and it can illuminate the ways in which racial reconciliation is possible. Uh, sufficient alone, again, kind of going back to that, I think scripture definitely, but I think it's always helpful to be able to have other resources. There are people who are older than us who've asked questions longer than we have, um, who've gone ahead of us in the journey. And I think that they, those resources are always invaluable uh, to us. I'll say this and then I'll shut up because you know there are other questions. Uh, there's a book by a man by the name of Howard Thurman, um, and it's called Jesus and the Disinherited. Howard Thurman uh, was born in 1899. He died in 1981. Uh, he was the first person of color in the United States to pass through a multi-ethnic church. And in the introduction of Jesus and the Disinherited, I highly recommend it. He talks about going to Sri Lanka for a conference. He's a professor at a university where he's written a number of, he wrote a number of books uh, but he goes to Sri Lanka and he said there was a Hindu priest that came up to him and said, uh, I get why they, wanting the white people, are here. Why are you here as a black person? And he said, if you would permit me, uh, he talked about um, one of the slave ships that brought African slaves from Europe, uh, I mean, from Africa rather to Europe, was named the HMS Jesus. And so he says, like, you look at the ways in which Christianity was used to be able to support or was manipulated to support slavery in the West. Why are you here? And Thurman's thesis in that book is uh, Jesus is poor, he's a person of color, and he lives under Roman oppression. And if we don't look at the ethnicity of Jesus, the context in which he lived, and the implications of empire surrounding that, then we can misinterpret the gospel. And Howard Thurman was one of those first singular voices that helped me to really look at scripture, not just from a biblical theology or systematic theology, but from a cultural uh, theology, if you will. And so, again, scripture, yes, but having other resources to help, I think, can be similar. <laughs> Guys, thoughts, comments? I have a comment. Um, yeah, I. Um, Can you say your like name I for me, too? This is Ronti. Hi, Ronti. <laughs> I see. Oh, you can see right from my photo. I'm African American, Nigerian American. Um, and so I was watching, I was listening to the third podcast, a colored commentary podcast, and they were mentioning about how we don't, at least in the Western, in America, we don't talk about some other theologies um, that other cultures have, you know, produced over years, and I like that you mentioned that it's like it would be really important for us as a church to continue to be diverse in our, um, the theology we use to understand scripture, so it's not just coming from one cultural perspective, but a wider cultural perspective. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, seminary was helpful for me in some ways, uh, and it was very painful for my faith and others. Uh, I went to Fuller Theological Seminary, and I've talked to Dr. Mark Laberton about that. He's the president. Uh, I still uh, am an adjunct professor and TA for a professor's 
perspectives and social ethics there. Um, but it's been, it was viscerally painful. I think God in his sovereignty allowed me to go to seminary from 2014 to 2019. Uh, I, my orientation at Fuller was uh, two weeks before Michael Brown was killed. Uh, I signed up to take Christian ethics uh, the day after same-sex marriage became legal in the United States. And so you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, you look at the Me Too movement, you look at the election of Donald Trump, um, all of these major like maelstrom issues, regardless of what side of the, of the spectrum you are on those issues. I think to be at a Christian seminary during that time, um, I was salivating with the opportunity to be like, oh yes, finally the Christians, we, the leaders, <laughs> they're going to illuminate and shed light on these issues, finally. I get to sit back and learn from the greats, and they're going to show us the way. How do we interpret the times and think, you know, Christologically, and and all all these different big words that you learn in seminary? And we didn't talk about it at all. I mean, it didn't come up not one single time. And uh, I had to like I dragged kicking and screaming. Uh, I was so confused, and it went from confused and hurt to just furious. If I'm honest. Uh, I took one class called Modern Theology in a Global Context. And, you know, I was like, that's what I'm talking Modern Theology. All right. The 21st century. Let's talk about these things. What's going on? We spent eight weeks in Germany uh, studying from dead slaveholding theologians. And in the last two weeks, we covered Black people, Latino people, Asian people, and women. <laughs> in two weeks, I was furious. Uh, but you have to step back. I needed that because it, it created it in me, illuminated the dichotomy that existed. And it said that if I wanted to be able to learn and grow in these areas, I could not delegate that responsibility to someone else. I had to, as is the custom in the West, become autodidactic. I had to become self-taught. And so it forced me to go on Google or on Amazon for myself. It forced me to talk to my Asian American coworkers within a and say, okay, how did you do that? Like, how did you look at that text and eliminate those things? Oh my God, Sarah, Quan, every time you speak, my brain fires on all cylinders. There's something about the Jesus that you know that I don't. Who are your people? Who are you studying? Let me come over your house. <laughs> I'll take off my shoes at the door. Let me see your library. <laughs> Who are you reading? Uh, it forced me to do that. Uh, and I am the better uh, for all of my friends uh, across the cultural spectrum that challenged me to think cross-culturally, even in my theology. And I promise I'm Baptist trained. I will truncate my answers. I can talk forever. So, <laughs> I posted a question. Yeah, go for um, it. So, hi, so, hi I'm Paul. Um, so, my question that I posted was one of the challenges that I find um, in areas like where we live, well, not all of where we live, but parts of, parts of where we are in Texas is, or Dallas, is a degree of segregation, right? So you have, you know, communities that, um, communities of color that are scattered, and then you have communities that are quite homogenous, that take up big portions. And there's just such a disconnect, because if you are a Christian living in a homogenous, comfortable area, you know, your, your reality is not impacted at all um, by injustice or racial um, injustice. And, um, you know, your theology is shaped by that. And so we have, you know, I mean, not that the church is splintering, but we have, um, you know, really, really um, uh, representations of the church and we serve the same God. Um, but just completely different experiences and and degrees of openness to addressing some of the the issues um, when it comes to, to race in our society and things. So I find it challenging, especially on Facebook and other places, um, because <laughs> <laughs> because you have you know all followers of Jesus and all Absolutely. people who love Jesus, but um, you know. Um, for people who are are clustered away, sheltered away, and we used to call in college in the Christian bubble, um, where there is no racism, because <laughs> right? they're not racist, right? And and uh, you know, and I find that 
in a city or society where not just the church, but the entire society has been engineered to be segregated, to have inequality in education, inequality in services, inequality in access, all these things it's beyond the church, but it leaks into the church. Um, how do we talk to our, how do we talk to our brothers and sisters who just don't get it? <laughs> Let me just hit the lights, Maestro. Let me give a PowerPoint presentation on the founding of the Western world. These are all the systemic and structural issues. Now, based on that, how does one engage in a conversation with someone of the dominant culture that may not be aware of said issues that are in the foundation of the society in which we reside? Good. We need to have lunch for like six weeks, brother. That cannot be answered in the time frame. <laughs> And also, welcome to what keeps me up at night. That's why I watch Star Trek to calm my nerves, because my brain goes down that exact same deep end. Um, let me, I'll try to answer it, it probably as, as personally and as practically as I can. Um, from a personal standpoint, I have retired from Facebook conversations, um, when, level one Facebook conversations. It is emotionally exhausting. Uh, someone asked me to share, and I will. Uh, they asked me to talk about what it was like to be a part of um, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship as the largest, mostly white, evangelical parachurch ministry in the country. Um, and to be a student at Fuller, be leading evangelical seminary. It was, it was wonderful. It shaped me in incredible ways, and I'm forever grateful for it. It's also emotionally exhausting. Um, and so, I don't, I don't have those types of conversations on Facebook. I think you cannot convince someone precisely, Paul, of what you just said, you masterfully in, in a very brief format, walk through, hey, really the foundations of West, the Western world from Plato and the Republic, the first time we men mentioned that you should classify people based on their outward appearance. I mean, it's in the foundational reading documents, this idea of Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, white superiority, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, uh, and the Quakers all are leaving Europe with the understanding that they need to return to their roots, this exceptionalism of whiteness, and that idea of white superiority and obviously white supremacy, the ways in which that is in everything from the lyrics in Amazing Grace to the National Anthem to the Constitution of the United States. It is there. We've edited those and tried to rewrite history, uh, but those are there. How do you illuminate that for people? You can't do that in a Facebook post and, and a conversation. Um, so I typically don't do those on social media because uh, it can get very argumentative very quickly and it's just emotionally exhausting. What I typically do is if I am, and I'm just going to assume that this is someone white or a person of color who has a predominantly um, white Western education and what I call a colonized theologian, that they are not aware, I think, of their own cultural locale and the theology that have been birthed from their own context. And so I think when I'm speaking to someone from that context, I don't typically launch into a platform presentation like, here's what you need to know, here's what's going on. Wake up, my brother, sound like I closed with Dr. King, like there's a revolution going on, you were asleep. I don't, I don't start there because I'll, I'll, I'll be yelling for like 10 hours and I won't get any work done. Um, what I typically do is I give books. Um, we live in the West and we have an idol of intellectualism. And so if someone says that they are interested in learning more about these things, I give them books to read. Hey, if you're serious about this, you should check out Michelle Alexander and the New Jim Crow. You should read Howard Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. If you want to read like a Christian perspective of someone who's evangelical, you should read Sung Chan Ra, The Next Evangelicalism, Helping the Church Escape from Western Cultural Captivity. I give them those three books to read. And then I, I say nothing else. And if they send me, if they tag me in a Facebook post or they send me a Facebook message in two weeks, I'm like, hey, did you read those books? Or did you even buy those books or skim the table of contents for them? No, nah, brother, I didn't have time. Okay, yep, nope, I'm not going to respond. But if in the span, the next time that we meet, they reach out, they've read those things, they have questions, or even if they disagree, I know they're serious. Um, I think firmly, what I talk about in, the, um, in my little consulting company that I've started as my side hustle, I talk about these four principles of awareness, acceptance, action, and advocacy. Well, the first thing is awareness. Um, and that's, I think, you need cultural awareness, you need historical awareness, you need biblical awareness. Uh, I always talk about Nehemiah chapter one. He asks what's going on. 
And if you look in Nehemiah 1, when his brother tells him, you know, the people have survived the exile, but they're in great trouble and disgrace. The walls are down. The gates have been burned by fire. His brothers are there in Jerusalem. They see it firsthand. Uh, and the text does not mention how it's affecting them. But you see how it affects Nehemiah. He weeps. He mourns. He fasts for three months from Kislev, I think, to Nisan, the beginning of chapter one to the beginning of chapter two. He spends what's the equivalent of our summer, fasting and mourning and praying. His heart is broken. And so it takes not just uh, like uh, an informational awareness, it takes a spiritual awareness. Like our hearts have to break for the things that break God's heart. And we have one of the consequences of racism in America is that for people who have um, only matriculated to the dominant culture in our society, there is a cognitive disconnect between the realities of what's going on in our society um, and how it should affect them in terms of being in a community. Uh, Joy DeGry talks about this masterfully in her book, uh, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And if you ain't got time to buy the book, just type in on YouTube, Why Black People Are the Way They Are. It's absolutely a phenomenal book. She's a PhD professor and she walks through this hour long lecture. And at one point in the lecture, she shows um, um, really hangings from the 1920s and 30s. And she said, we've all seen these before. They popped up on Google, on the news, wherever. She said, I don't want you to focus as painful as it is on the body that's hanging from the tree. I want you to look at the white faces in the audience. And some people are smiling. I mean, some, some of these pictures are graphic. Like they have people set on fire or there are men, women, and children who are hanging from trees. And people who are smiling, they are posing with guns or there's just a blank stare. And she said, this is not one instance, but if this goes on in the nation really for 350 years, it bursts a cognitive disconnect, dissonance. There's a disconnect between what's happening in society and the trauma that we're looking at right now. And we talk about the ways in which um, slavery impacted the African-American community. We don't talk about how it impacted the Asian-American community and the fight for Chinese to try to come into the United States, that on the books in California, Chinese were the first people to be excluded because of their ethnicity and culture. Um, we don't talk about the ways in which it's affected the dominant culture, that there's a consequence of society telling you that you were superior when in fact you were equal. Um, when one is accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And that's why you've got like a lot of the white revolt that's happening right now. Um, so again, you can't say all of that, but what you do is you say, hey, here's some books to read. And you wanna try to raise awareness for those things. And if the awareness comes, and then you can move to an acceptance that there's a different worldview out there than you may not know. And then from that, you can go to action steps. And then ultimately, you challenge them to be advocates. But that's what I would say, brother. Like, you, my suggestion is guard your heart, guard your mind. Be careful of your insects. You've got to know when to engage and when to disengage. I typically don't on social media. Um, when people are curious and they want to learn about those things, I give them, I just come up with a list of like, hey, here are my top five books to read. If they started that, if they start to look at those, then I know they're serious. If not, that's someone who is not very much aware of what's going on. And I think only the Lord can change the heart. Um, only the Lord can bring that type of illumination because this is not just a matter of flesh and blood. It is, I think, the predominant spiritual force of evil that exists in the Western world. I mean, it, it is the primary tool of the evil one. Uh, and that is racism uh, and some type of way to make one per one people group feel like they are better and the other one is less than. Uh, that is sin made manifest. And only the Lord can bring that type of illumination. So. That's great. Thank you so much. That's a great thought. Yeah. Thank you. I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> I got burned out on Facebook, man. I was, man, I was, I was, I was the Lord's troll, boy. I was anybody. <laughs> Anybody that asked the question, I wrote dissertations for days, man. Yes. And it's that old Jewish proverb, man, waste not fresh tears on old sorrow. I'm, I am pouring out my heart. And this person's like, oh, you're entitled to your opinion. This is a riveting discussion. I'm going to go to the lake house and reflect on these things. I just, I just got stopped by the cops two days ago. Like, you know, it's not, it's not a discussion. Like, these are people's lives. And I had to say, yeah, no, no. <laughs> there are levels in which I will engage and there are levels in which I'm like, you you need to read some more books or like listen to some more people or experience displacement and when you realize that like your perspective is limited to your purview that there are other things that are going on in the nation then then we can have a conversation but until then i'm like ah, mm -mm. so so this is a question that's um 
asked a lot, especially from Asian American communities. Um, uh, it's a question that's asked in the Indian community a lot of how do we engage with family members or friends who know that we know that dismiss or deflect the hurt of the black community because either slavery happened a long time ago um, or um, hey, this is a black and white thing. This is not something that we are supposed to get engaged in or involved in. How do we speak into that? And if I can add something on that, Sam. Um, Go ahead. How could we engage with them when they personally have have had their stereotypes reinforced by black communities or black individuals that they have met or lived with? Um, and in doing so, kind of close themselves off to the rest of that conversation. Where, for example, they were like, say, I was harassed by a black person, therefore, you know, my mind is made up already about black people and I don't really want to have anything to do with this conversation. Mm. So, uh, the brother just spoke, your last name I'm assuming is Hong and that's not your first name. Uh, so I got that part. Sam, can you repeat the question for me one more time? I wanna make sure I'm, I'm tracking. Yeah, so um, how do you engage with uh, family members, friends that you know that dismiss or deflect the hurt of the black community? Um, one, either because slavery happened a long time ago um, and it's not um, that conversations I mean, we'll just keep repeating this conversation over and over. Or two, um, uh, we're Asian. We're not supposed to be engaged in this conversation. Uh, this is an issue between black folks and white folks, and we just need to stay quiet and out of this conversation. Or as Hongo said, um, uh, their stereotypes have been reinforced by experiences that they have had, and so they are open to having conversations or engaged in these conversations. Gotcha. Um, there's a poem that I'm looking up right now. Uh, let's see. There is. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So there's a poem that um, uh, is in the Holocaust Museum in the United States, and I want to be able to read it. And I can now print it. It's Martin. Nimoler, I believe is his last name, and I may not be pronouncing that wrong. I mean, I may, I may not be pronouncing that correctly. Um, but he said in the Holocaust Museum, he said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. Um, and so I think, let me begin by saying uh, we have to discern how we want to live in the world. Um, as Christians, uh, we are, we view the world as lens that every human being is made in the image of God and therefore has infinite value, period. Uh, and that our response, kind of what I said in the message earlier, is that uh, to be Christians and to view the world as everyone is made in the image of God, then we have a visceral allergy to injustice. And that to say that we are Christians or that we live in community and to not, um, in some respects, I think, have a call for injustice for the margins, I think is, you have contradicting beliefs. That's probably a nice way to be able to say that. Um, and so that's one of the launching pads in which I start with. It's like, we either care about people or we don't. Um, and I said that before when I was at the university, like my experience had been in most evangelical circles when kind of all this was beginning, uh, was that, hey, your joys are my joys and your problems are all your own. That was the NFL stance when Colin Kaepernick was first taking the knee. Our joys, your joys are my joys. As long as you can score touchdowns, we're fine. Your problems in your own community are your own. Stop taking a knee. This is disrespectful, blah, 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 blah. They blacklisted him, and now the NFL is like, oh, my God, we're apologizing. Everybody can take a knee once COVID ends. You know, <laughs> we won't apologize to Colin, but everyone takes a knee. The NFL stands for these things. So I think that's one. I think it has to be, um, there has to be, like, we have to be in community together um, as Christians. And I think that's how we demonstrate our salt and our light to the world for those who are not Christians. Um, 
that the way in which we love them, the way in which Jesus loved the world was that he died for it. And so the ways in which we demonstrate our love for the world, the ways in which we demonstrate care and compassion, uh, particularly even for the margins and the marginalized. I think for, uh, in terms of more broadly speaking, I think for the Asian American diaspora, we need to have a broader conversation about race and ethnicity in America. It does not surprise me in any way, shape or form that I think the Asian American community is struggling to find its voice, is struggling to find out how can they both be allies at the same time say, we would love to be allies. We have issues in our own community. We have issues with uh, the dominant culture, with white people. We have issues with black people. We have issues within the Asian diaspora as a whole that never get highlighted or rarely get highlighted and discussed. And so I think sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to, um, I think it's difficult for Asian Americans to try to figure out how do we speak into the black white binary, right? Because it's anytime the conversation is reduced to black and white, it automatically eliminates everyone who is Asian. It automatically eliminates anyone who is Latino or Latinx or brown, right? And so how do we create space at the table so that everyone can have a conversation and that your contributions to the conversation are not just limited to your perspective on black and white issues? Um, and so I think at a basic level, even that is, that denies the equality I think that is due to, again, the broad Asian diaspora from Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese, the whole kick and caboodle, my Filipino brothers and sisters, my South Asian folks, Moliali, non Moliali, the whole nine. Um, I think in terms of Asian Americans who have had negative experiences with African Americans, and they have said that these one, two, five or 10 experiences then have given them the litmus test of all African Americans, I would, as much as I am capable of engaging in indirect communication, I would probably directly respond to that. <laughs> I always feel in indirect communication when I get mad. Um, I would probably directly respond to that um, because I can very easily pinpoint uh, experiences that I've had with Asian Americans and say, if you get to take these bad experiences or the worst examples of my community and let that define all of us, then I get to do the same. I get to talk about um, the Asian Americans who were first generation that owned the corner stores in the hood where I grew up. And every time I walked in, they followed me. I get to tell the story of seeing my mom and my grandmother curse out the Asian American that owned the grocery store on the corner of my grandmother's church because he thought I was trying to steal some gum that my mom asked me to go get that she would pay for. And he called me all types of negative names, which I won't repeat on this video. And when he went in, my mother went in on him because she only had one child and she was very protective of me. My grandmother with two prosthetic knees saw them arguing and got out of the car with her cane and came inside. And we never went back in that store again. Uh, and I think three or four years later, it burned down because he did the exact same thing to someone else who was not as nice as my mother or my grandmother. And that person didn't tolerate it. And how they demonstrated that was not in a constructive way by choosing to take their business elsewhere. They demonstrated it in a destructive way and they destroyed his business. So I think there have to be these conversations of saying, we have individuals that exist in a community and at what level do you want to respond? What level do you want to engage? If you want to come from an individual, individualistic perspective, then that person has the right to do that. I think if they want to see the world change and be in a better place and they want to respond to that from a Christian perspective, then there's a different hope that we have to have. There's a different approach that we have to have. And there's a different lens through which we evaluate those experiences. So. Does that make sense? That was a lot. Okay. Um, I would just simply ask Reddit, who uh, we're, we closely work with, is working through a series of questions, answers that are answering these questions from Indian American perspective, Asian American perspective, Hispanic American perspective on why this conversation must be happening in our community. And so we have just started doing some work on this. And so that should be coming in the next um, several weeks or so. so. There is conversations that are happening on this specific topic in these communities that hopefully will be helpful to um, equip to engage conversations. So, I got one question that came in via text. Um, it says, Sean, what grieves you about the church in recent days in response to everything that's going on? What gives you hope about the church um, 
in response to everything that's going on. Ed Spencer um, said a couple of months ago, uh, if the church of today woke up and found itself in 1950, uh, it would be behind the times. Uh, and I think that's what grieves me, uh, I think, about the church right now. Uh, we are 20 years into the 21st century. Like I, in my opinion, there should not be a single pastor in the United States of America that if a cop kneels on a handcuffed black person for nine minutes on camera and chokes him to death, there should not be a single pastor who stands up in the United States of America and says, oh God, are these things still happening in America? That is appalling. Um, it is someone that I think has been educated outside of the context of America um, and has been educated in a way in which they are just not aware of what's happening in society. Uh, I don't say that it's Christians because uh, all of us come from different backgrounds, but I think as, as pastors or spiritual leaders, we have a moral and ethical or spiritual responsibility. Um, the call to preach is a call to prepare. And content is very important, but context is equally important. And it grieves me that 20 years into the 21st century, we have so many people who are blindly unaware of any of these issues that's going on. Um, one of the reasons why I still lecture at Fuller is because I want to, not in a bad way, I want to make all of them uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't want any of them to graduate. I'm like, I had no idea these things were happening. I am going to rock your world if I get the opportunity like to be an adjunct professor or a TA or grade your papers. I come for people, not in a bad way, like, you know, I want them to graduate, but they will, by the time they're done, they're going to either say he was crazy or I need to read some more books if I'm going to like lead well. Cause that's like the, you know, like the, um, let's just stereotype for a thing. So Angelina Jolie, what was that? About 10, 15 years ago, that was her thing. She went to Cambodia and she came back with a Cambodian baby. And then she became an ambassador and every country she went to, she came back with a baby from that country, right? That was the thing in America for like 12 years, adopt an Asian baby. Everybody wanted to be able to do that. So do you actually know how to raise a child like in their proper context? Like what's going to happen when they go to school or when they start dating, anything, right? How are you raising them in a way in which they can even be bicultural? Um, and I feel like that's how some pastors are like, that's the new thing right now. We want to have black people in the community. Do you know the blessed burden and responsibility it means to pastor Black people in the United States of America? Most don't. Uh, and so that, that grieves me because um, I think we've, we've done the same thing over and over and over again. And it's 2020 and here we are. Like some things have gotten better, obviously, but in terms of the systemic and structural issues, they really haven't changed. We haven't changed the underlying motif of racism uh, in America and in the Western church. And as a consequence, we keep having to have the same conversations over and over and over again. Um, I think what gives me hope is that um, God will not be mocked. And if God is a God of justice, uh, his justice will not be delayed for very long. Um, and I think you, you see I mean, 2020 has been the year of like Old Testament biblical proportions. What the heck is happening from a global pandemic to a global protest to just like, this is nuts. Like this, this is, we've only been like, what is this? Six months into the year. <laughs> what else can happen? Good night. Um, outside is closed. And, you know, we got people protesting with masks on right now. So I think there's some sense in which, um, if I'm honest, I think, um, kind of the high morals that Western society claim to have has been exposed. Um, America claims to be the leader of the free world. It's, in reality, it's an empire. We can talk about that later, but uh, it's been exposed for that. I think you look at the issues that are going on in the country. Um, I think the church and our seminaries have been like, we are the leaders in Christian logical thought. And we've had another social justice incident. And at best, we get a tweet or a blog post or you know you get the the moniker on the website we stand with black lives matter even though they couldn't say it six years ago um and that's it and i think now we're seeing what happened in the new testament where the spirit is like not necessarily leaving the church but it's being poured out in the streets and we are seeing this example of the rocks crying out like you have people who 
in some ways are deeply spiritual um, and in some ways love Jesus, but do not trust the church. And they are being stronger advocates for justice and righteousness and truth. And so I think there's some sense in which God will get glory no matter what. And so that that really gives me hope. I think the sense in which the church, sadly now, in some respects, is starting to follow the world in terms of engaging in these issues. But I think um, I think that there is a possibility that the Lord is doing a work that could lead to either repentance and or revival, I think, because um, it's needed, I think, in order for us to navigate the issues of the 21st century. So. Speaking of the church, um, can we talk about the issue of like, how just because you have minorities or people with not white skin in your organization, whether that's your church or your nonprofit or whatever it is, that does not mean that those voices are actually being listened to. It just, it may just mean that they're welcome to come in as long as they'll do what we want. And as soon as they start bringing a perspective that's different, then we do have a problem with that and we will run them out. That's a good point. That's actually another question that just came up. Um, and the question was, Sean, how do you, in your mind, how do you differentiate between multi-ethnicity and multicultural? Um, what does that look like in your mind? And so. <laughs> oh, God. Um, let me give a disclaimer uh, for what I'm about to say. Um, I became a Christian in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, and uh, InterVarsity's values back in that day were uh, we want to grow students in the four loves, love for God, God's word, God's people of every ethnicity, and God's purposes in the world. Uh, that has shaped and changed my life. Um, and I am indebted to the ministry of InterVarsity. And their, their fingerprint on my heart, my mind, my thinking, probably about like 99% of the cross-cultural relationships I have um, came from InterVarsity. Uh, I have friends from all around the world, uh, from every tribe and tongue that we are in communication on a daily, if not weekly basis about issues. And so I'm grateful for them. Um, that being said, uh, the biggest reason why I am not on staff with InterVarsity anymore is precisely because of that. Um, I was on staff with InterVarsity from 2005 until 2010, and I led the ministry that I became a Christian in for five years on UT campus. And I wanted to see us uh, grow ministry to black students in Houston and in Dallas. I mean, it's, there are no black people in Austin, like at all. It was 15% black when I got here in 2000. It's 7% black now in 2020. Like we were leaving in droves, and this was the only place that we had a ministry for black students. And so I was like, you know, Houston and Dallas are black Mecca. Like, you don't even have to pray. Like, if you just set up some music and a sign that says free food, black college students will come. <laughs> you don't even need God to grow a ministry to black students right now. What are we doing? Like, Houston and Dallas, they are, they are Mecca. This, this is low-hanging fruit. Um, and we just, I could not get any traction um, at all. I was underfunded the entire time I was on staff at university. Um, I left staff in 2010, and um, I came back. Uh, really because um, I left, it was a black, I was a black guy, my best friend Darnell left, he was a black guy, and this guy named Jeremiah had a very bad cross-cultural conflict with a white male supervisor, and Jeremiah resigned abruptly. And you lost three black men in the span of one year, and black student numbers tanked in the region. And so the previous year they told me, we're fine, more or less, we got enough of y'all, we're good. So we all left <laughs> because of systemic issues, and they hired me to come back. And so I remember I came back and again, Trayvon Martin is killed like the week I got the job and we're setting up to have a regional staff conference, uh, I'm sorry, a regional leadership team meeting and I wasn't invited. And um, I've gotten better as I've gotten older, but I was hot as fish grease. And I, I emailed my South Asian boss and was like, we need to have a conversation when y'all are done. And he said, you know, I didn't think that you wanted to be able to come. I didn't see a reason for you to come. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm a regional coordinator of all things black in, in, our, in the region, right? You know, supervising your black staff, working with black students, supervising by that wants to work with black staff and black students, which to be blunt, y'all suck at, which is why you hired me. Why would you think I shouldn't be in these meetings? Um, and in my naivete, I thought that the only reasons why we weren't reaching black students 
uh, in Black Staff was because there wasn't someone there to show the way. I didn't realize that there were systemic and structural issues that were at work. Um, that uh, at that time, TB Black and University was to fight to have a seat at the table, but it was a different battle altogether to get equity in that seat. In other words, to have the power to affect systemic and structural change. And part of the reasons why I left University of was precisely because of that. Um, and the organization has gotten better in some ways, but that was very difficult for me. Um, we, um, right when same-sex marriage became legal in the United States, uh, we produced a 20-page paper on biblical sexuality, or rather nationally you should did. And they were like, you know, we're defining marriage between a husband and a man and a woman, and um, People have to believe and behave according to this, which makes sense. I mean, it's an evangelical organization. And they said, like, you have to sign this paper and you have to um, believe and behave according to it. And if you don't, you have six months to leave staff. And at first, you were like, same sex marriage just became legal in the United States. So technically, it's illegal for us to do this. Aside from that, we have men who have left this nonprofit because they don't think a woman can supervise them. And we've never written a single paper that says we believe in the leadership of women in this 501c3 nonprofit. We've never fixed our funding policies. We have people of color who are on food stamps and they are campus ministers right now. Um, and they've never been fully funded. Uh, we don't have a clear definition on multi-ethnicity. So I have some white staff who voted for Donald Trump and believe firmly that there are no problems with race in the country who wear Confederate shirts to staff meetings and <laughs> are upset that there are black students are not staying in their ministries. And I have some white people who are angrier than I am at race and injustice in America, and I have to calm them down. <laughs> we have all of them. We have the whole spectrum. We don't have a clear definition of multi-ethnicity. So we've never fixed our strategic, our strategic, our systemic issues with women in leadership, funding, and multi-ethnicity. But we are going to harp on same-sex marriage. And that for me was the deciding factor. I was like, we, you can't do this. You can't pick and choose your battles. Um, and so I think to be in those types of organizations, you have to recognize that. You have to realize um, what you're being invited into, where they are and where they stand on all of the issues, how they're going to engage on those issues. And you have to figure out um, if you are an Esther and a Nehemiah, will you exist inside the empire and use your person, your privilege or your position to affect change or, or are you going to be a Moses and say, no, you, you have to let people go. I, I come as a prophet saying, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Um, it's difficult and it is costly. Uh, uh, there was a black exodus from InterVarsity. There's been one from Fuller Seminary. Um, there's some people who stayed and I think some people have to stay, uh, but then there's some people who have to be there, stay with the Lord has called you to stay, but then you have to be, you have to leave for the sake of your own health. Um, and to, I think there's a, I'll say this and I'll shut up. There's, um, I believe there's power in redemptive suffering. It's like there are ways in which God calls us to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Like we have to be in those spaces. We can't all of a sudden choose that we don't want to be displaced and live in a cross-cultural community with people. You can't do it unless Wakanda is real and you can move there, which it is not. Uh, we have, we need each other. Um, and so there's power in redemptive suffering, right? The Lord can mature us and develop us in those areas. Um, there's, there's really no power in, in unredemptive suffering. In other words, suffering unnecessarily. Uh, and I think too often to be in those types of multi-ethnic contexts that are not multicultural, um, that, that, that's unredemptive suffering. That's the suffering that the Lord has not called us to. Uh, multi-ethnicity means you've got people with different ethnic backgrounds in the room. Multicultural, uh, how I define it, multicultural means you have people of different ethnicities and cultures in the room and that cult, those different cultures are also represented on stage and in power. People will hear, they will see people who um, look different from different cultural backgrounds from up front. They will see and hear different teaching styles, different singing styles. They will hear theological issues that are immersed from different cultural contexts that there is no one way to interpret the gospel, that when you have um, the indigenous voice, the black voice, the white voice, the Latino voice, the Asian and South Asian voices together, that multicultural um, tapestry, that reveals what the kingdom of God looks like. The God is concerned about all of those things. And we become well-rounded Christians, I think, when we can hear all of those voices, and then together we discover for what it means for us to be the people of God. Um, that's how I define multiculturalism. All the different cultures are there, but they also have equity and a voice to be able to lead and affect change. 
multi ethnicity is we need some diversity in the photo. Um, but we really don't want to leave this thing one way, and it's our way or the highway. Uh, so. <gasps> a baby. Sorry, I'm a sucker for kids. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he's a cutie pie. Oh. <laughs> Uncle Sean has not seen his nieces and nephews since COVID hit. I am struggling. So, oh, my. He is cute. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Christine. Oh my, the cheeks, Kai. Oh, he's a cutie pie. I'm sorry, Sam. Yes, sorry. Good, good. I had You're a question. Good. Hello. Of course, Paul. Hi. Hi, my name is Itlali Ramirez. I also became a Christian through InterVarsity. Um, I was born in California. I lived in Georgia for the most, um, for the majority of my childhood, and then I came to. El Paso, Texas, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know how to formulate this question, but um, when I knew you would speak in a varsity, I would make sure to show up. <laughs> I would make sure to, to listen or to read um, the things you would post. And I rarely get a chance to speak um, to the black community because, because I live in El Paso and we're mostly all Latinos. And I wanted to take your view on reparations because there's so, there have been years and years of oppression against the black community that I couldn't even begin to fathom how much it would take to be able to be in an equal footing as the white community or even just the Latino community because I recognize that I have privilege as a Latina and as a woman as opposed to a Latino man. I mean, that's, it's, even within our own community, we have privilege. And this is a question that I've been thinking about for a while, but I haven't been able to ask anyone from the black community. And in my opinion well, is that there should be some reparation because if you look at the percentage of black farmers who have lost their land because of unjust practices in banks, it's, it's just very, very saddening. And those years of land that were in, in families, I mean, that land that was in the family for generations are lost not because the black farm, farmer is a bad farmer, but because of horrible practices. And so I, I just want to take your view on that because in my opinion, there are reparations due to the black community. Ooh, oh, this is a multi-ethnic church and not, um... Uh, a white western evangelical one, Lord. She said the automatic like talk killer, Lord. You, we, they don't mention the R word. Good night, reparations, Jesus, Lord. You you are not going to speak at Urbana, ma'am. You can't say that word. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm serious, but I'm kidding. Um. So uh, let me say one thing parenthetically, and then I'll I'll talk about reparations quick. So we can talk off script. I'd be curious to hear about the um the privilege that you both have and perceive that you have as a Latina and as a woman um, in that community. Um, I can't speak to that as I am neither one of those. Um, I would just love to hear more about that. I think what I have felt and seen is that patriarchy is very real and that men have power without question from the ways in which we interrupt all women when they speak in every context. Um, and especially like I think the, this the current racial climate that exists in our country. So I think in EPT in El Paso, um, there may be power and privilege there. I'd be curious about the macrocosm of it. And so um, I'm just curious to hear about that because I, I want to be able to learn. I don't have all the answers and I'm very curious uh, as well. So I want to be able to say that. I think um, second, uh, you have been everywhere. Sweet baby Jesus, uh, California, Georgia and Texas. That is like the West and the Confederacy. So you have a very unique perspective. So I, again, I feel like I should be listening to you. <laughs> That's, that, that, is, that is a lot of people, a lot of different contexts. Um, a lot of different, yeah, that's, that's just a lot. And you've seen a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. So I'd be curious to see kind of what you've seen and what you've learned. Uh, in terms of the R word, um, reparations, oh my. So I think short answer, yes, without question, I think reparations are due to African Americans, not in the form of checks. Um, I think reparations are due in the sense that um, part of the vitriol that I think we 
see and feel uh, in the black community is that this tremendous injustice has happened to the community really for 401 years, like without even an apology. Um, we apologize to uh, the Japanese community. I think Bill Clinton did it. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's kind of bad for us to take land and property away from Japanese Americans and put them in internment camps during World War II. Well, it was kind of bad that, you know, the European immigrants came over and took all the land from the First Nations indigenous people. That kind of stuff. Like there's, there's been nothing, uh, I think, towards the black community. And I think even kind of what we saw in the news this past week, right, the president wanted to have a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth. And everyone was like, you, you do realize like Tulsa had like the largest prominent African-American, the wealthiest black business community of 35 blocks and a white mob just went in and just kind of killed everybody and destroyed everything. And Tulsa has never really recovered from that. I went to Tulsa and spoke on racial reconciliation and I was like, it is hot here. Good night. <laughs> I thought Texas was rough. Sheesh, Tulsa. Like, <laughs> y'all need a small group. This is difficult, man. <laughs> Good night. It's some, it's some tension in here. Ooh, well, I mean, I live in the Confederacy, too, but this is, there's some, y'all got some stuff to work through uh, 90 years later. Um, and so I think you look at the broad conversation for that, and it's it's not, I don't look at it in terms of reparations. I look at it in terms of, like, repairing the damage um, that's been done. Um, we had a generation of European people that came to the country and they owned slaves for 350 years um, and built generational wealth from that. Uh, we had 15 to 20 good years of reconstruction and then we had 90 years of the worst lynchings that have ever happened in the known world on any continent. Um, and then for the last 60 years, we have had generations of the dominant culture say I am colorblind or I don't see those issues. Um, we have yet to have a generation come on the earth to say what would it take to make it right? We had multiple generations benefit from it. We had um, a couple of generations unleash terror in the country. We really haven't had that generation come on the earth to say what would it take to make it right? And I don't think that that responsibility is on white people. I think that responsibility is on the United States. The United States has to come to terms with its African American population in a way in which uh, the reasons why America has uh, one of the largest economies in the world is because it got three centuries of free labor um, and it got free land. <laughs> I know nothing about economics. If I can't build a great nation with free land and free labor, I suck. <laughs> Anybody should be great if you have those. Um, so I think America has to come to terms, I think, with its own past. And I, to be honest, I don't think America will. I don't think America will. We don't give away money. We don't. So, I mean, Donald Trump, for crying out loud, this man said, we used to pay people to go to work. Now we're paying them to not work. Like, they almost had a stroke when they gave people $1,200 a couple of weeks ago. We don't give out money in America. Not for free. Absolutely not. So, um, I don't think America ever will do that. I think the church has a responsibility to do it. I think the church has a responsibility to say, what will it take? to repair the damage. You see that in Acts 2, you see that in Acts 4, they gave as there was need. You see that principle in the Old Testament, the year of Jubilee. Um, I think if we were living in biblical times, there's no way on earth Jeff Bezos would become a trillionaire in five years. That is an example of what is broken and flawed in a Western capitalistic society. Um, the Lord never intended there to be a few people with a lot of money and so many with so little. Uh, and I think uh, reparations, again, it's not about taking money from any one group and giving it to another one. Reparations says, let's repair the damage that has been done. Um, and so I think without question that's due. I don't think America will do that. I think the church has the spiritual and ethical and moral responsibility to be able to do that. And I think that's how the church, or one of the ways in which the church reclaims its witness in the world, that we don't continue to operate in these Western systems of oppression and injustice but the church is a radically different place. Um, and it operates with a different type of community and a different type of economy. So that the issues that we may see in the world, those don't exist when we come to the foot of the cross. I missed the question that was asked earlier, I apologize. Uh, the question was, systemic, structural, institutional racism gets much of its foundation from the lens of critical race theory. How do we reconcile critical race theory with scripture? Um, 
And could you define critical race theory for those of us who might not be familiar with that concept? Did you ask that question again, Sam? Oops, hold on. Um, systemic structural and institutional racism gets much of its foundation from the lens of critical race theory. How do we reconcile critical race theory with scripture? Yeah, all right. So um, it's been jumping around in my mind for a long time. So I think um, critical race theory is just this framework that um, shapes policymakers and our approach to understanding uh, inequality in terms of education and systemic and structural racism and the ways in which you want to find uh, some modicum of justice. Um, there are five uh, principles of critical race theory, and I need to be able to pull them up. Where is it? Um, I know a couple of them off the top of my head, but it's been a while since I've like had to define them. So like the five of them are like it's um, that racism is ordinary, that uh, it's a social construct, um, um, that pretty much white people have been the dominant culture and are not the cause of all of those issues, but a number of them comes from this idea of Anglo-Saxon white superiority and white exceptionalism. Uh, and I've forgotten the other ones. But critical race theory is pretty much it evaluates that social construct of race um, and then takes that perspective and says, now let's look at the ways in which race has kind of impacted the world as we know it, the Western world as we know it. Um, for example, uh, I have a black fashion Tai Chi. I've been practicing for four years. If you study any Asian American, any Asian martial art, uh, a white belt is nothing. Everybody starts at a white belt. Uh, a black belt is the pinnacle, right? That's the highest that you can go. Uh, in America or in the West, uh, white is personified with beauty and with cleanliness. Uh, though our sins be like scarlet, Jesus washes us as white as snow, not as clean as snow, but as white as snow. And black is associated with that which is dirty and disgusting and um, unsafe and sin and evil. And so um, you racial race theory looks at all of those elements, our language, our context, the ways in which uh, colors have been ascribed to specific ethnic groups. And as a consequence, those who come from European descent can lose that cultural black ground. They're labeled as white and there's privileges that they um, automatically get accepted to. And there's some ways in which there's some privileges that even though they don't experience them in a monetary perspective, there's a social way in which um, they have access to some of those things. The dangers that black people feel when they experience or are stopped by law enforcement that most black people don't experience and know about. And the other side of that being African-Americans, the black diaspora, whether you are from uh, the continent of Africa, if you're Afro-Caribbean, if you have dark skin, you were labeled as black and there are consequences of that. Um, so race, the race theory deals with all of those things. Um, I've heard the conversation before, I think in terms of how do you reconcile race theory with the Bible? And what I would say is, uh, I don't begin with race theory, I begin with scripture. And if you begin with scripture, you see different ethnicities and different cultures in the Bible and you see the ways in which scripture deals with them, I think in positive ways, and you see the ways in which scripture deals with them in very painful ways. Uh, you have mass genocide that takes place in the Old Testament, and it's done by the Jewish people and the people of God. Um, and, you know, we can make a case for why the Lord allows that, authorizes that. We can make a case for why it shouldn't have happened that way, and that Israel was just a violent people because they got from Egypt. There's a bunch of different interpretations from that. You can look in the New Testament. Um, when uh, the Apostle Paul says, I confronted Peter to his face because Peter is supposed to be this missionary to the Gentiles and he's hanging out with the Gentiles all the time. And then when the Jewish Christian shows up, Peter got up from the table with the Gentiles and walked over to the Jews and started sitting down. And Paul was like, you are tripping and you just became racist again. Get back. That's my interpretation of the text. Get back over there with the Gentiles like he was doing before the Jewish people came. That's, it's in the Greek. <laughs> so I think you have to begin with scripture. And I think you have to read scripture, I think from a cultural lens and a cultural interpretation. Uh, I think critical race theory is helpful in the sense that it provides language to what is going on in Western society. Um, I don't know the person who wrote the question and I won't assume the context from which they wrote it, but I will say my experience has been, I mostly hear from white conservative male theologians who 
um, are not cross culturally aware, they typically, particularly like the John MacArthur's, the John Piper's, they will reject critical race theory because they think that it is not biblical or that it does not, it's not rooted in scripture. And there's some truth to that. There's also the reality of those types of people um, are not cross culturally aware, both of their own power and privilege and the realities of what's going on in America. And also too, um, are woefully inadequate when it comes to talking about issues of race and culture and class. And so for them, critical race theory will help to illuminate some of the racism and classism and all the sexism and all the isms. Um, Dr. King wrote a book called uh, Letters from a Birmingham Jail. Obviously, he goes to Birmingham, as he says, because injustice is there. And he's writing from um, uh, jail and talking about these issues. What's omitted is the fact that those letters were addressed to four or five white pastors in Birmingham who did not want him to come to address those issues. It is a seminal book. Everybody in their mama needs to read it. Um, Brian Loritz, who's a pastor, he used to be in Memphis. I think he's in New York now. But Brian Loritz, uh, he used to do a Kynos conference and it was the only church conference that dealt with multi-ethnicity that was led by people of color. And uh, the first conference they had, I went to it, uh, he got Brian Loritz, John Piper, and a bunch of other prominent evangelical theologians who were all men um, and the ladies did shoot them out about that. Uh, the boys got together and wrote a book and they wrote a book called Letters to a Birmingham Jail. And they were all supposed to write a letter to Dr. King some 50 years later, like, you know, I don't what. Thank you for illuminating these issues, for addressing them. Here's what's happened, blah, 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 all these. The one chapter in, the, oh yeah, Dr. John Perkins in there, a lot of folks. The one chapter that made me as hot as fish grease that's an African American euphemism for being very upset. The one chapter that made me hot as fish grease was uh, Dr. John Piper's. Because everybody in the book wrote a response to Dr. King about issues of race and ethnicity and injustice. And thank you for illuminating those. Piper was the only person who critiqued King. He was the only person that was like, your sermons weren't very theologically rooted. I wish you would have spent more time talking about these things. Uh, I think you had an amazing opportunity to affect the theology in the African American community. And Piper even said at the conference, I don't know where I was when Dr. King was killed. These issues of race and ethnicity, like they've never been on my mind before. I am just now starting to think about these things. And so um, I always try to both look at the question and look at the, the context from which that question has come. And I think critical race theory, as Christians, we start with scripture. We don't start, I think, with this world interpretation of it. But we also, I think, can't dismiss that because I think if wisdom comes from the Lord, not just from human intellect, and if there's some truth in this, then I think we have to do our due diligence to say, how do we view this theory in light of the word of God? What are the ways in which it lines up? and true and it helps us uh, understand the times and interpret scripture. And what are some ways in which, no, this is worldly and it is it doesn't have any eternal significance and value. And as a consequence, be free in Jesus' name. You can put it off to the side. So. Um, since you brought up John Piper, I think that it's important, to, and this, Sean, this is Santi, by the way, my legal name comes up on this thing, if you didn't know this was me. Uh, Sean, it took me actually, a minute. <laughs> Sean and I actually met many years ago when I was doing a master's at UT Austin, so we know each other from Austin. I was so surprised to see him, but it was a pleasant surprise. Anyway, so this is me, Sean. Um, now that you bring uh, up I Piper, I just want to again highlight the fact that like there is a spectrum on this stuff um people being like further along than others or like where their blind spots are and all that kind of stuff because um as i was listening to you talk about john piper i'm also thinking john piper adopted a black daughter um and named her talitha um from that passage in scripture where jesus brings the the dead girl back to life and says arise little girl um, so, I mean, I, I probably everyone on this call knows that it's a marathon and not a sprint, but geez, I mean, just because you're whatever doesn't mean that you won't have blind spots too, or that you can't fall into the whole, like, well, you don't need to study anything but scripture. God's word is all we need. Um, I actually went to Wheaton College with one of John Piper's sons, um, who's very nice. I have nothing bad to say about him. That's not where I'm going with this, but I'm just saying that like, um, there were the people 
and are the people who say that like God's word is all you need. And I'm just like, okay, well, God's word is like definitely the starting point, like Sean said, but it's like, do we really expect scripture to go through every single manifestation of what sinful humans have done with the world with a fine tooth comb? Like, is that realistic to th think that scripture would do that for you? And so I just, I feel like the word of the year just needs to be, or the phrase of the year just needs to be both and. Like we need to reject all this either or thinking that doesn't get us anywhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this, I completely agree. And that's not the, um, I use Piper as an example because uh, he's one of those leading voices, him, Tim Keller, and a couple of other folks, like you know their names and instinctively. There's a rule of their books, I think, uh, in the library. And so there are, like all of us, there are amazing contributions that they give. And when it comes to issues of race and ethnicity and culture in America, there are some ways in which, yeah, I use the words woefully inadequate. Uh, are, they are woefully inadequate, I think, when it comes to addressing those things. Um, I, to be blunt, I followed John, probably that's not true, I didn't follow John Piper. Um, <laughs> I was aware when he wrote things, because he said some stuff sometimes. Anyway. I followed uh, Andy Stanley. I followed uh, Tim Keller. Like I, like, I was a Tim Keller fanboy. I mean, I was, like, reading the book, podcast, the whole nine. And um, I think when Trayvon Martin got killed and Michael Brown got killed and Eric Garner, John Crawford, Tamir Rice, Renisha McBride, the list goes on. Um, these were leading voices that I was looking to, I think, to be able to, to speak and to say something I said about seminary. Um, Piper, uh, not Piper, uh, Tim Keller, like the the um, the slogan for their church in New York, right, is is in the city for the city. Uh, and he champ he's an university alum as a student and as a staff worker. And um, he is a big vocal component of racial reconciliation and justice. And so when those shootings happened, I was scouring in there, waiting for those sermons to come out, waiting for his books to come out, for his blog and his podcast. And there was there was a, a, a deafening silence that kind of came out of those communities. And um, I was angry for a number of years at him, at Piper, uh, at Andy Stanley um, for their comments. And I'd take a step back and say they're speaking from their own context and their own perspective. And it, I think it's, it's part, of the ideo part of the ideology in the West is that we look to one person to be the solution for all of our problems, when in reality it's Jesus and scripture and the rest of us there really are no shepherds. We're all older sheep, <laughs> and we get to we get to wear a shepherd's uniform from time to time. But we're all older sheep, uh, and the, also the responsibility is to I can't. Um, I've been on a journey just trying to decolonize my mind, and so for the last two years, I said I'm only reading books written by women and written by people of color um, because I need to have if my faith is going to survive the 21st century and get me to the end of my life, I I need a different world to drink from. I need deeper roots. Um, because the world that I have been drinking from has gotten me this far, but I, it can't get me any further than this. Um, and so that's just that's just the reality of it. Uh, and I'm grateful that Piper and Keller and some of these other cats are coming to awareness of this in their 50s and 60s. Uh, I am 37. <laughs> I don't have a kind of time. Uh, I, I got to do something different now uh, because when I'm in my 50s and 60s, I it would break my heart if a woman or if a person of color or someone white came up to me and asked me a question about these issues. And I was like, I have no idea. I've never thought about that. It would crush me. So I think I have, I have an ethical, a moral, a spiritual responsibility to be aware of the times in which I live and to make sure that I am as cross culturally prepared as I can be um, to help guide us into healthier times. And I think also to, when necessary to be a priest uh, and also to be a prophet, to speak into the storm um, when it is one of injustice. Can I also just throw out real quick as a, a white person, <laughs> I'm seeing critical race theory a lot on my newsfeed right now. And this is where I'm having to resist the urge to uh, what my husband calls the mission to civilize. Um, I have a, my academic background is sociology, so critical race theory does not make me uncomfortable. Conflict theory doesn't make me uncomfortable. I just see it as a way of understanding society and societal change. 
But what I'm seeing from a lot of my conservative friends is they're using it as a reason to dismiss some really important black thought leaders. Um, and so I just say that as a challenge for anyone else that's seeing it on their newsfeed like I am to, um, to be okay with being uncomfortable. I think it's important for us to hear perspectives that are different. And so I've been uh, sad and grieved as I'm seeing a lot of white peers saying, I can't read, read white fragility. I can't read color compromise. I can't pay attention to be the bridge because it's, it's uh, divisive. And I think that it's being used as an excuse to silence some really important voices. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Kathy, that's great. And tell me, what did your husband uh, call it again? Uh, I want to feel that. That's great. The, what is that? The mission to civilize. It's from the newsroom. If anybody's seen the newsroom, but he it. he had to get off Facebook because he was trying to civilize everybody. <laughs> oh, ma'am. Yes, he is right. Look, I am on Twitter. I 140 characters is all you getting out of me. I'm like, I have retired from Facebook. No, the mission to civilize. I like that. Mm. <laughs> Yes, Kathy, that's fantastic. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Like it's, it's difficult, and I think it's um, when all the you know I, it, it's painful. I think for all of us, not just for myself, but I think for all of us because we love each other and we're friends and we're community. And if you've been in ministry, like these are people that you've led. These are people that um, you've worked alongside. They're people that we've looked up to, and like you know we follow their quote unquote careers, their lives, their ministry, and. Um, these issues of race and ethnicity, if we are aware of them, if we've got wisdom and knowledge, then, you know, we, we want to be able to see change uh, happen. And uh, I like we've seen the Old and New Testament. This is an injustice. What is difficult about this? <laughs> Let's bring justice and call it a day. And that way we can have a better world. Or, um, you know, you're in a different spot. You're like, tell me more. I want to learn so that I can grow and I'll figure out my opinion along the way. And it's difficult to see people that we do life with, that we break bread with, that we share communion with, um, have these visceral responses that, depending on the level in which they respond, they go against the core of who we are as human beings, or they are just shocking that people that we know and love and, and trust deeply would have this type of a view and perspective. It's, it's just painful. It is. And I think it's okay for us to be able to say that. I think the 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 mission to civilize i love that sweet baby jesus i am stealing that that is in my lexicon at least for the rest of the year good god it's difficult <laughs> to see that um because you you know you you want we want i think as christians we want peace and we want harmony um not the absence of conflict but as dr king said the presence of justice and it's hard to see people um kind of double down and like you know this view and perspective which in many respects is trying to protect the world in which they know um, because their world is shattering. And that's, that's just really painful. Um, there's a book called uh, From the Garden to the City. and the, Don't buy it. The book is horrible. But it has one good principle in it. Uh, he talks about technology that is, exists when we are born is just normative, right? Like it's just been there for us. The television. The television has always been around. The phone has always been around. Um, he said technology that's invented up until the time you're 30, it's great wonderful life changing we we are um you know progressing as a society and everything that gets invented after you're 30 is de is of the devil it's horrible it is sin made manifest the world is going down and we have to do something to stop all of this chaos uh, and that's that's really all it is there's an older generation that grew up in a very different society and there's another generation that's coming up that says there's a better way to live and they're asking some difficult questions of how an old generation lives or how a younger generation has been influenced by that older generation. And that, that's painful. Um, and so we have to resist the urge to be on a mission to civilize. Good God, I love that. I'm gonna have to watch Newsroom. Jesus, that's got wheels. I like that a lot. We have to resist that urge because um, it's, it's, it is painful. And this is, this is, like Santi said, like this is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Um, but Katie, can I just say like, I, my request from the heart is just like white people keep telling other white people to resist the temptation to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, like it's, it's received far differently when you say it, you know that by now. And it is a shame that, you know, people have co-opted the conversation to make it political and giving people an out, I think, so that they can be like, oh, well, I agree with this, but I don't agree with all this other stuff. 
And because I don't agree with all this other stuff, I get to just opt out completely, you know, which is also part of privilege. Um, so yeah, white people like just continue. My request unto you is to keep asking people to like not do the easy thing and just quit when they hear the things that they don't like and, and like do the uncomfortable work of acknowledging that there is still a problem that still deserves time and effort and energy. Don't worry, I just it's civilizing. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. I just realized why I hate TikTok and Snapchat because they all came after I turned 30. So that's why they're all <laughs> together. Um, I have promised Sean that we would keep him till one. Um, it is past one. Um, so uh, if there's any other questions that you guys want to ask, um, uh, feel free to email me. I will forward them to Sean and um, see if we can get a response from him. But Sean, I will let you have the final words. If you would, any final words of encouragement for us as a church body, and then if you would just pray over us as we close as well. So. Absolutely. Um, I am putting in my uh, Twitter handle and my blog, um, so that way, by all means, I'm a big proponent of like, let's keep the conversation going, stay in touch. Um, we're Christians, we're family, so we can always do life together. Um, part of the one word of encouragement I would give to everybody is uh, I remember, um, I don't remember which shooting it was, but I remember I was very like, I had the, like the, the prophetic rage. I was, I was mad and just ready to march and protest and change in a varsity completely early and totally and, you know, meet with the president and vice presidents and, we need to do the following 56 things today, you know? <laughs> and uh, there's, a, there's an older guy that's on staff. His name, we call him Bishop. Uh, Bishop Tony Warner. Um, Bishop's been on staff at university for like 42 years. And there are only two black people who've been on staff at university that long. They're small staff. Um, Bishop was on staff when it was like him and one other person. Like they were the only two black people on staff in the country. So, you know, we would gather at, at a national staff conference they would get the black staff together and be 50 of us in a room in an organization of 1200 employees and we're like this is not right we need more black people what are we doing and bishop is like it was me and one other person <laughs> black staff conference was us in the car on the way to these things so um so bishop is like my go-to whenever these things were going on and so i was upset about all the issues happening in university and bishop smiled and very calmly looked at me and he said sean they've they've taught us wrong in the west that um, the Lord can change the world radically and completely in our lifetime. Sometimes he does. He said there are examples when it does happen. He said, but if you go back and look in the Bible, he said there are very few examples where God drastically changes the world in the course of one person's life. He said, Sean, the West has taught us wrong. Israel waited 400 years for Moses. And we misunderstand the timing of God that sometimes God will move it from zero to 10 in our lifetime. And sometimes our job is to move it from zero to one or from three to four, from five to six. And so I think sisters and brothers, um, these are trying times without question. Uh, we see the issues of race and ethnicity and class and gender at work. We didn't get time to even talk about that. And the ways in which gender is drastically being affected right now in our nation. Patriarchy is quite real, uh, particularly under this administration and the ways in which you've seen the Me Too movement give birth to that and call men into account in positions of power across the planet. Um, these are trying times. And I think the issues that we normally would see happen once in a generation, they've been happening every 18 months. And so there is a level of awakening happening. To us. There's a level of trauma that none of us will know how this has affected us in 10, 10 years out <laughs> when we are taking high blood pressure medication and talking to our therapist every week. <laughs> like, there's a lot going on. Um, but I do also think, too, into this generation, the Lord has sent each and every one of us. And God and his wisdom has brought us all together. And whatever our part is, we must do it to the best of our ability. Now, that is what it means for us to be the people of God. And when we are our best, I think the body of Christ is its best. And so um, let me pray for us, please. Um, God who is living, uh, it is a gift and a privilege um, to know you and to be in relationship with you. God, I am always amazed 
any time that you allow the people of God to gather. And I step into a new room with people who are both strangers, but also are family. God, I am so grateful that there is cultural diversity, Lord, but spiritual unity. That all of us look different and are different. Um, but we worship the one true God. We follow you, Jesus. Uh, and so I pray for my friends at Lost City Church, God and Pastor Sam and his leadership. God, would you, would you give the church wisdom beyond their years to know how to navigate these trying times in which we uh, currently reside? Lord, give us wisdom and discernment to know when to speak and when to listen. Lord, help us to know when to engage and when to pull back. Lord, help us to know when we need to be priests and to go before you in prayer. Lord, to know when we need to be prophets and to speak truth to power. And when we need to be practitioners, Lord, when we need to put our feet and our hands in the dirt and just get to work. Lord, we too often are at a loss for words um, and we don't know what to do. But God, you are never surprised. Uh, and so will we, remind, will we be reminded, Lord, that your arms are strong enough, your shoulders are broad enough to carry each and every one of these concerns that we have as individuals and as a church and as a city, as a state, and as a nation and as the world. And Lord, you were at work uh, both in the good days and in the bad. You were at work on the mountaintop and in the valleys of the shadow of death. Uh, and so I pray simply, God, that you be glory from all of this, from every single incident of racial tension and systemic oppression and injustice for the ways in which you were illuminating the realities of what's happening in our nation. God, would you get glory? Would you bring about revival? Would you bring about repentance? Would you bring about restoration? Would you bring about reconciliation in this world so that men and women would look at the church and they would see a different radical community than the one in which you called each and other to live out? Um, for that is what it means for us to be the people of God. Would you bless my friends, Lord, as we leave this digital space, but never ever from your presence, we do pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Lofty Church. It has been too long. It is good to see all of you all. Thanks, Pastor Sam, for the invitation. Truly, my brother and my friend, it is a gift and a privilege. So thank you very much for letting me share.